This is the Y'all Show. Talk with a Southern accent. I'm John Rawl. Great to have you aboard here on the All Southern Program, where each week at this juncture, we're fortunate to be joined by our barbecue barrister, Matt Herbens, and he's joining us now for a discussion on all things Q and a little bit of life advice as well. Welcome into the show, barbecue barrister. Happy to be here, John. As usual, I heard something about life advice, though. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure I'm qualified. For oh that. Let's yes, give it a shot. you're certainly qualified. You're our guy <laughs> because barbecue is life. We've got a couple of things we sure. want to bring up with you here on the program, oh barbecue barrister. But one thing that I wanted to first talk about, I was scanning the headlines of the Southeast here, leading up to our conversation with you, and when I saw this headline, I said. I got to get the barbecue barrister's take on this because it's something we've not talked about. Coming up in Nashville at the end of this month, they have the 2020 National Meat Cutter Challenge as professional meat cutters come to the Music City for a big thing out at the Gaylord Opryland Resort and Convention Center. And they'll be slicing up more than 4,000 pounds of meat in hopes of being crowned Texas Roadhouse Meat Cutter of the Year. So, Barbecue Barrister, I've got to ask, how important is it to have sliced meat, and are you part of this competition this year? Wow. (laughs) So, very important short answer. Um, Meat cutting is just the art of butchering, right? So, that's all that is. What you got is a bunch of of butchers, a bunch of um, folks who are very skilled at breaking down an animal, is what they call it. So, um and I'm sure it'll be timed. I'm sure it will be uh, judged on accuracy of the cuts and what type of meat. There's a show. This is interesting. You brought this up. There's a show called, uh, I think it's called The Butcher. I can't think of what channel it's on. But it's essentially this. It is a competition for meat cutters. And I found, I've watched the first season of it, and I found it to be totally fascinating. You know, I got a little thing for meat now. That's, you know, let's be honest there, but. It does require some skill um, and some knowledge of how these animals are put together. It's almost like deconstructing an engine or something like that. So, um, yeah, that's pretty cool. It's very important to have somebody who knows what they're doing. We've always, or I have always been an an advocate of uh, buying from your local meat market as opposed to, you know, a large national corporate chain just because I support small businesses and I like local communities to have their own, um, their own uh, places like that but it is important because if you don't if it's not if meat is not cut right there's all kinds of different things you can have uneven cooks right you can have part of the uh, part of the meat that's fatter on one side than the other particularly on a steak or something like a chop or a rack of ribs for instance Um, you can have parts that you do not want into that piece of meat you can have connective tissue and sinew um, tendons and things like that that are attached to a piece of meat. Uh, help me out here. What did you just say? Sinew? Sinew. <laughs> sinew. Uh, I'm going we'll to send you a Valentine's tendon. card. But... Yeah, we'll send you right back to the butcher shop if you give me that. So, um, yeah. So there's, it, it is well, What important. is that, it's, sinew? It's like, a, it's like a connective tissue. It's oh, just okay. another kind of word for like tendons and, ah. and stuff like that. So, anyway, yeah. Um, very important uh, and good butcher shops, good meat markets uh, have good meat cutters and they know exactly what is going to sell. They know exactly what the most expensive parts of the, the animal is and they know how to present it well and they know how you want to cook it. So um, I would say a long winded way of saying uh, really important and a really cool thing for sure. So I ask you barbecue barrister, if you don't have your meat properly cut, and oftentimes, most people, I guess, use a local butcher for that challenge. Do you need to know how to properly get that meat cut up before you even think about putting it on the grill? Well, you know, it depends. Typically, if you if you buy something from a meat market or even a grocery store or a butcher mm-hmm. shop, it's going to be prepped the way you, you like it. Now, um, there are a couple different things that are, would be helpful to know. You know, it would be helpful to, if you're going to do ribs, for instance, it would be helpful to know how to remove the membrane from the back of your ribs. That's that's probably something your butcher's not going to do because some people like it on, some people like it off. Um, if you buy, so for instance, a bone-in pork chop, some people like to remove the bone. 
uh, and just cook the chop without the bone. I prefer the bone on myself, but it's helpful to kind of be able to do some little small, maybe trim ups like that. Um, it's also nice, particularly if you're buying meat from a grocery store uh, and not a meat market that's going to basically cut it right there for you to your specs. It's good to know how to kind of trim up uh, some fat on a brisket or maybe trim up some fat on a pork butt or trim up your ribs to make them look pretty if you're going to buy spare ribs, for instance. So, um, yeah, you know, a good a good meat market, a good butcher shop, a good meat cutter is going to give you, you know, dinner-ready meat. It's exactly what the point of it is. But it's not, uh, not necessarily a bad thing to kind of know some little tips on how to trim it up uh, from time to time, depending on what kind of meat you're cooking. We're talking to our barbecue barrister here on today's Y'all Show, Matt Hermans. And before we go diving into the grill, when it gets a little bit warmer weather out here, we need to know how to properly get that meat cut up. And again, coming up at the end of the month in Nashville, it's the 2020 National Meat Cutter Challenge. Is that something you've ever participated in, something like this? No, no. That is that is a skill that is um, outside of my realm. I, I, I like I'm fascinated by it, and I have a lot of uh, respect for butchers and people who can break down an animal like that. But no, that is nothing. I want to go look at look at a guy with a bloody apron and say, "Here's what I need," and then get it from him, and then take it and make delicious barbecue. That's my that's my part of it. So no, I've never I've never uh, never gotten into the the meat cutting, although it is it truly is fascinating. Yeah, some of the competition. This is a competition taking place. And it'll be toward the end of the month, February 25th. I know it was one of the days of this competition. Each participant receives 30 to 40 pounds of beef consisting of one sirloin, one filet, and one ribeye to cut up. The meat cutters are then judged on quality, and the winner is the cutter who yields the most steaks with the highest quality cut. How do you stack up there in that department? There you go. Um, yeah, so it would depend on uh, depend on the meat. Um if you're doing ribeye, for instance, uh, every different cut uh, of meat, and of course there's, you know, there's pork chops and ribs and like, like they said, sirloin, different types of meat. But for instance, if you were going to do ribeye steaks, you would probably be judged on uh, the thickness, uh, the evenness of the slice. If you're going to cut a ribeye steak, you might cut it with the bone attached. And we call that a bone in ribeye. Um, it's got to be even from side to side. You want to have a good fat distribution, um, and you you want uh, you want the bone to be sawed through nice and cleanly. Um, so you want the steak to look good. You know, for instance, if you yeah, on a fillet, for instance, that's a beef tenderloin. All a fillet is, is a beef tenderloin that is cut into uh, fillet mignons, which are little uh, rectangular steaks, which is what everybody knows of a fillet. But for instance, that would be, that is such a lean piece of meat that is probably, they're going to judge you on the trimming. You don't want any fat around the filet. You want it to be essentially pure dark red meat and you want it to be shaped perfectly because on a filet, for instance, you want that thing to cook evenly. You don't want a, um, you don't want a filet mignon to come out to a table and it be lopsided or it looks like it was hacked up. It will be fat on one side and thin on the other, right? It's got to be perfectly shaped. It's got to be the right thickness and it's got to look right. So. There's all kinds of things that go into it, and I'm not an expert or a judge. I'm just a, a big <laughs> fan of meat, you know. So, yeah, there's going to be um, – that's going to be really, really cool. I'd like to I'd like to do that one year. You know, I'd like to be there to watch it happen one year. Well, maybe dreams can come true for you sometime. We're talking about <laughs> this event. It's taking place February 25th at the Gaylord Opryland Convention Center in Nashville, now, one reason you might want to partake of this, Matt Hermans, and all of you who are listening and watching us here on today's Y'all Show, do you know what the grand prize for this said cutting challenge is going to be? $20,000. That's a Oof. lot of money for cutting up meat. Man, that's a lot of, you know, I don't know what, that, that's a <laughs> lot of meat. That's yeah. what I'm thinking of. That's a lot of meats. Do you think most of the participants in this contest are butchers? I would imagine either whether or, you know, what I have seen is um, people who break down animals, hunters who ah. you know, most hunters, most hunters will take a deer or uh, even a hog or well, whatever they, they manage to kill to a processing shop, which will have a meat cutter there. Uh, but some will do it themselves. So um, there's some of these folks that are really dedicated to 
going from, let's say, uh, cleaning the gun to uh, meat on the table. And they like <laughs> to do all the steps. So, you know, farm to table, let's say, hunter stand to table. And so some of these people will be very, very good at breaking down animals as well. So I would imagine, yeah, most of them are butchers that work at meat markets. Uh, but I, I imagine there are some hunters out there who like the whole process who are involved in that as well. Well, this particular event in Nashville is sponsored by Texas Roadhouse, and you're a guy who knows a little bit about Texas. Have you been into a Texas Roadhouse? And if you have been, what do you think of their meats, their steaks, and other grilling options there at this national chain? Uh, I have not. I've never eaten at one, and I'm not. You know, I'm not saying that to to uh, try to be Mr. Cool. You know, <laughs> they, no they may not exist guy. in Texas. People in Texas may <laughs> not even go to them. Isn't it, it's like a Chili's, isn't it? Um, I'm, I'm only, I, I really don't know. I think it used to be called Logan's Roadhouse. But no, that's anyway, a different, no, that's a totally different place. Logan's yeah, is based think, out of Nashville. In fact, Texas Roadhouse okay. could be connected to Logan's. I don't know for sure. It is a little odd that they're having a Texas Roadhouse competition in Nashville. You know, I think, oof, I don't want to do fake news. I'll leave that alone. But yeah. I, for some reason, I think they're related. But okay. that could be something else. You might be absolutely right on that. Regardless, here on the Y'all Show, we just want to let everybody know about this event taking place again February 25th. It's the 2020 National Meat Cutter Challenge presented by Texas Roadhouse. And by the way, to Texas Roadhouse's credit, if you are a Texan and you just love your Lone Star flag, but you just happen to be outside of Texas and you're just dying to see that Lone Star flag flying proudly, go find you a Texas Roadhouse and I guarantee you'll see the Lone Star flag flying high atop that. And oftentimes you'll see that Lone Star flag flying at a Texas roadhouse, and you won't see the state that you're, you're in, its flag flying anywhere near you. Just say They've got yeah. Texas pride on display there at Texas roadhouse. <laughs> hey, we've got something we're going to bring up after this time out with our barbecue barrister, Matt Hermans. And it's something I know that's very near and dear to him, at least one of the two, but I think both of them are. So a little tease here. I haven't told him what we're going to be talking about. And to bring us in from break will be a song that is perfect for this conversation. So you don't want to miss it. It's coming up next as we wrap up this Tuesday Y'all Show with our barbecue barrister, Matt Hermans. What's the song? Stand by. It's the Y'all Show, taking you back to the 1980s. 1987 was the year for that one right there that helped get uh, act. And we don't often play hip-hop music here on the Y'all Show. And so we've got our hip-hop expert joining us right now, Matt Hermans. <laughs> and as we wrap up our Y'all Show here today and this act, you probably recognize that song if you were around in the 1980s. Salt and Peppa is the act. And Matt Hermans, I know you love Salt and Pepper, the hip hop group, maybe, but certainly the other Salt and Pepper. Yeah, you're you're right. And we call, uh, as far as Central Texas style barbecue goes, that's called Dalmatian rub. Ah, okay. Um, which, yeah, because it's black, you know, black pepper and white salt. So, yeah, I can say I, my wife is a she likes Salt and Pepper. In fact, she knows a little bit more. Uh, the lyrics and the songs there that she probably uh, she likes probably, salt and pepper uh, the musical act or the the i guess well uh, both table both things you find on your table <laughs> both <laughs> both so yeah i can't say i do like the condiment but put it that way yeah okay well let's break it down which one you want to go with for salt or pepper man let's do salt you got i mean that's that's salt is 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 the is the salt is the salt of the earth that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Absolutely. So we'll we'll do what you just asked. We'll bring up salt in honor of salt and pepper as we <laughs> talk barbecue with Matt Hermans. So the question is, I guess, when we talk about meat, let's break it down with beef versus pork. How much salt are we talking about for both products here? Okay. So let's. I want to. I want to say this because I know we have. We talk a lot about uh, barbecue on the show, obviously, mm -hmm. and we say we say things like uh, savory rub or sweet rub or sugar-based rub, things like that, where 
if if someone's not baptized into the barbecue obsession like we are, yeah. then this may be confusing. You know, sweet rub, it sounds like sugar. You know, savory sounds like salt. Any any rub that you're going to use, uh, this is just a good start, is going to have salt. Is going to have quite a bit of salt actually. So is that the main access, ingredient? Yeah, absolutely. It's okay. got to have salt. You've got to salt your meat, whether it's a sweet rub or a savory rub or a Memphis style rub or a, doesn't matter. And one of the main ingredients is going to be salt. So there, when I when you describe it other ways, like sweet or Memphis style, what you're doing is you're talking about the other ingredients aside from salt. Uh, you, you cannot, you will not have tasty barbecue without salt. Period. End of story. It doesn't work. Um, if anybody's ever, for instance, tasted a piece of meat, a steak, or a hamburger, or a pork chop, or a piece of chicken, anything, and you bite into it and you say, "Man, this thing needs salt. I don't doesn't have any flavor to it." Now you want to avoid that. You always got to have salt. It is the world's number one flavor enhancer, and it's got to be in every rub. So. That's a good place to start. So when I say something like, well, I'm going to eat, you know, it's a sweet rub. It's got a lot of sugar. It's got a lot of sugar on top of a lot of salt. Okay. So that's what we're talking about. And the more savory rub, if I say something that's not, I'm talking about a rub that's not as sweet. What I'm saying is it has less sugar and it's still got salt. So that's kind of a good baseline to start with. But you have a good question about pork versus beef. And the common uh, refrain or the common kind of uh, rules that everybody goes by is that pork loves sweet pork <laughs> pig loves pig loves sugar and i think that's probably true i think pigs will destroy an entire uh sugar cane patch in a matter of hours but the the meat itself pork loves sugar um pork is a is a is a blank canvas for just about any flavor profile you want to use and it does like sweet it likes brown sugar it likes all kinds of different spices it likes cinnamon it likes allspice it likes chili powder it likes pepper i mean it, it it likes everything but it really really goes well with sweet so mm-hmm. you think of a pork sandwich you think of a sweet barbecue sauce a lot of times you think of ribs you think of a sweet rub with a sweet glaze on it you think of ham with a honey baked out exterior that's crunchy and sweet pork loves sweet on you're other- killing me on all those comparisons you're you're a hundred percent right or you're a thousand percent right <laughs> So on the other side, the cow tends to like salt uh, and not not as much sweet. So now that's not to say that there aren't places that do uh, beef barbecue with a sweet barbecue sauce, for instance, or maybe a chopped beef that has a a sugary barbecue sauce. But as a general rule, uh, the, the the cow works a lot better with savory ingredients. When I say savory, I mean not sweet. I mean salt. I mean spices. I mean herbs. Things like that. So, for instance, the brisket that that you would eat in Texas, or at least in Central Texas, and most of the state, is not going to have any sugar in the rub. It's going to have kind of Dalmatian, like we talked about earlier, salt, pepper, maybe a little bit of garlic, uh, something else. It's not going to have any sugar. And people, a lot of people, are just going to eat that that beef plain without um, without any type of uh, sauce or anything but if you have sauce that's addition to kind of the savory meat so general rule is pork loves sweet beef likes savory um there are outliers to that uh for sure you know uh, pork chops you can do it salt and pepper it's good kansas city does burn ins and usually those have a sweet element to them and that's beef so there are outliers but as a general rule the more sugar um, the better with pork and stay away from it with beef that's kind of the general rule all right, well, chicken too. I'll throw the I'll throw the bird in there too. Chicken doesn't. We, we're all about diversity here on the y'all show with our barbecue <laughs> barrister Matt Hillman. So, right. what what is it? I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Chicken, yeah, no, equals the chicken. Yeah, you generally want a savory rub and an herbal rub with chicken. You don't want a lot of sugar on chicken. So there you go. All right, what about let's let's not leave out the pork chop. Yeah, pork chops are interesting. So just like I said before, pork chops really really good with things that are sweet like apple you know you think of like a 1950s recipe pork chops and applesauce right mm. but there's all kinds of different ways to do it i wasn't around in the 1950s so no i guess i, I wasn't either a, but, got left out on that one yeah i've heard of it though so but but so so pork chops are wonderful with things like brown sugar i like to i like to rub mine with a uh with a sweet rub 
and then put a little smoke to it, charcoal, and then I like to finish it with some brown sugar on top. It creates kind of a crunchy crust on the pork chop, and it goes really, really well with sweet. Uh, but you can also do a pork chop savory. You can do it salt and pepper. You can do it uh, with a less sweet type of rub, and it's good. Pork chop, it's going to be hard to go wrong, but I can tell you right now, most of the pork chops you're going to go and have at a restaurant are going to have some type of sweet glaze, whether it's a a brown sugar type glaze or a molasses glaze or an apple glaze. It's going to have something sweet because it just naturally kind of wants the sweetness. Ah, okay. Well, we like our sweet and we love our opportunity here on the Y'all Show to visit with the barbecue barrister, Matt Hermans when he's our very special guest each week. I'm John Rawl, wrapping up our conversation with the barbecue barrister. And now that we've kind of got the salt out of the way with a little sugar mixed in, what about this pepper thing, barbecue barrister? What is the <laughs> formula for it for both pork and beef? Yeah. Uh, so pepper comes in a few different varieties. Um, I think when most people think of pepper, generally we think of the black pepper. Well, it's, it's going to be black pepper for sure. But we think of the pepper that's in the little shaker mm -hmm. on a table. And that is what we call coarse ground black pepper. That means it is... Pepper, of course, is peppercorns. They're little little dark-colored berries. They get dried out into small, round, hard, black balls. That's what pepper starts off as. When you grind them up, it becomes the seasoning and the spice that we, that we use. Most people probably already know that. But you go coarse ground pepper, which is kind of like the salt shaker pepper. It's, it's kind of, it has a grain to it. You can see it when it comes out. And you've got fine ground black pepper, which is a little smoother, uh, more like powder. And then you have white pepper, which is a different type of pepper, and that is usually also powdery. So those are those are the three kinds of peppers usually used in barbecue, and I would say 90% of the time, a black pepper is the spice of choice. Now, just as you mentioned before, pig and beef kind of have different relationships with pepper. Um, a lot of times uh, across the South, if you're talking about pork, it's going to be light on the pepper. Uh, if you have a sweet rub, it's going to have other seasonings. They're going to kind of take center stage. You may have uh, some brown sugar, some white sugar, salt, uh, maybe some paprika, uh, things like uh, some people use tomato powder, for instance. There's all kinds of different spices using your rub. Uh, but a lot of times black pepper is going to be in it, but not featured, right? It's on the other end of the spec, because it's a very powerful flavor, and it goes really, really well with, with savory ingredients. It's just kind of a... Um, it's just a little bit of a hint in a sweet rub. You don't want a large black pepper flavor profile generally on pork. However, on the beef side, just like we said, beef loves salt, beef loves savory, uh, beef loves black pepper, period. Um, you think about a hamburger with salt and black pepper. You think about a steak. A lot of times you go to a restaurant, the steak is just going to have salt and black pepper, and that's it. Same thing with brisket, for instance. Lots of black pepper, lots of salt. That's that Dalmatian rub that uh, the Central Texas style brisket makers will use. And people, not only just in Central Texas, people who do brisket that style across the South will use that Dalmatian rub as well. Because beef, particularly beef fat, when you smoke it and it gets creamy and rendered, it loves that black pepper flavor. It just goes really well with beef. Pork, it's nice to have in the rub. It, most of your rubs are going to have a little bit. But it's not going to be 50% pepper, kind of like you would with beef. So uh, beef and black pepper are BFF, man. They're like <laughs> Snapchatting each other, right? And pork and black pepper are just kind of like mingling at a party on the other side of the room, kind of like winking at one another. Put it that <laughs> way. And again, with pepper, unlike salt, I guess you do have various forms of salt you could use. But you mentioned the different types of pepper. Is there one of those particular styles of pepper that's used more often, let's say, with the beef? Yeah, yeah, you'll want a coarse ground black coarse pepper. Ground. Okay, uh, coarse ground. You, yeah, exactly. You want that. Of course. To, of course, of course. It'll kind of turn into a nice, it'll give your your, your crust a nice texture. You definitely okay. want the coarse ground. Okay. And, and so the, the stuff you've got over there on the side of your table, just ignore it? Well... That's pretty much what you're going to use, but you're going to have, you're going to need a heck of a lot more than that if you're going to do a uh, big old beef brisket. And on the other side of that that uh, coin, and I do pork a lot. Obviously, I love I like I'm a big pig fan. I will use a finely ground black pepper or even a white pepper because I don't want those big coarse chunks of pepper 
on pork. I want it to kind of blend in nicely with the sweet and the other spices I have. Hmm. Well, those sound delicious, all of the options that you mentioned. So your basic salt and pepper, we've broken down how you can use it here, both for pork and beef. But also, what about pepper and chicken? What's your rule on that? Pepper and chicken, the, yeah, the, that's wing flapping good stuff, man. They like each <laughs> other. Um, it's a nice mixture. You know, chicken likes um, herbs, you know. It, chicken chicken gets along with, you know, thyme, rosemary, stuff like that. When you think of a, a smoked chicken or a rotisserie chicken, you a lot of times have those herbs. But black pepper on chicken, fantastic. Same with turkey. If, you, if it's got feathers, it's going to like black pepper. All right. So we love our pepper here. We love our salt. That's the the moral of the story, talking to our barbecue barrister. Barbecue barrister, we've gotten through the Super Bowl with you. We've gotten through the national championship and grilling out for all those big events. We've got Valentine's Day here this week. It's Friday, in case you have forgotten, both you, barbecue barrister, or any of our audience out there. What does barbecue slash grilling and Valentine's mean to you, oh barrister? Well, it usually means that I'm going to cook steak. Oh, what it means. so you're, I think, the wifey's okay with you staying home and cooking. You don't have to go to the most <laughs> expensive restaurant in your area, Code. Well, 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 we have a little baby. So what it means for me is cooking steak in the backyard. <laughs> it used to mean uh, going out to a nice place and having a nice dinner and, and doing that type of stuff, which is fun. But with a you know a four and a half month old, it it means it does mean I'm going to be picking up a steak at uh, the local meat market, and we're probably going to be enjoying it with the baby. So uh, yeah, it's uh, I encourage folks to give that a shot. I, I think people, and of course we're talking about grilling now, which uh, you know obviously a different method of barbecue. But I think if uh, I think if people would give it a shot and cook their own steak, maybe on a charcoal grill, I think they would be real surprised at how close you get to that $50 steak at a restaurant. It's, it's You buy good meat, and you know what you're doing just a little bit, and you might think to yourself, man, I'm not sure I'll pay that 50 bucks for that steak again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's just particular to steak, I think. Yeah. Well, I'm certainly not a person that needs to be giving out relationship advice here on the Y'all Show, but let me tell you from my own very – colorful background with the opposite sex the (laughs) one time that i went all out and went and cooked a big fancy meal specifically on valentine's day it was a very very successful venture so all right you can go and go to the fancy restaurants and spend bukus of money but if you just give them that extra attention that sort of one-on-one attention and, and you cook up a big fancy meal in fact you're going to hate this. I did some kind of fancy Italian spaghetti type concoction. It wasn't necessarily out on the grill like you would do, Barbecue Barrister. But it got very fancy with the ingredients and all that. Oh, and, yeah. and I had other parts of the meal, and it worked out quite well. So if if you're sitting there on the fence this week wondering if you should go down to the Texas Roadhouse Friday night, well, maybe <laughs> you need to bring your own grill into the picture and cook for your sweetie. And if you're a girl or woman out there and you need to maybe do something for your your man or whatever your love interest might be, then don't leave out the fact that maybe you might be one to grill up. Does your wife ever grill anything for you, Matt? No, we uh we keep That's that it. Divorce very, right now. Yeah, we keep uh we keep the food preparation separate but equal. That's what we do. <laughs> so what does she do? What how does she contribute to your relationship? it's <laughs> a good question john no i'm just kidding um no we uh if it's outside i'm doing it if it's inside she's probably uh probably doing it ah. so there are a couple little recipes i like to mess around with in the house but if it's an indoor cooking project she's probably handling that and if it's outdoor i'm all over that that's my territory ah so keeping the the wife and husband separate separate but equal and that's what that's we right. like and right. by the way, you said you got a couple of month old child now. Has she had a? Is she at the stage yet to try daddy's cooking yet? No, she's about four and a half months. So I think they say six months is when they start being able to eat pureed stuff. Okay. So I think maybe the first thing is going to be a a little pork butt in the in the blender. <laughs> and I know it's going to be a big event in her life. 
something uh-huh. that goes right along with getting your driver's license and that day that she leaves you to go to college. But that force, first yep. taste of pork butt is going to be oh so <laughs> special for the Hearman's family. Matt, no we can't thank it. you enough for coming back on the Y'all Show and talking about all this great stuff from a cutting competition of meat to the importance of salt and pepper, both for pork and for beef. We always learn so much when we talk to our barbecue barrister, barrister and it's so wonderful to speak to you again, sir. Thank you very much. I will uh, I will count the hours till next time. John. All right. Matt Earmans, everybody. Well, that will wrap up our Y'all show today. Make sure you join us on Wednesday. We'll be right back here with more of the show that's all about the South with a little Atlantic Coast Conference sports talk. What a crazy game they had in Chapel Hill versus Duke, UNC and Duke this past weekend. We've got ACC talk. And then we'll also have our country music spotlight, courtesy of Precious Harris. All that on the Wednesday show. Until that time, y'all have a great rest of your day.